So, you've always wanted to visit Iceland and see the Northern Lights. With 18 to 20 hours of darkness, wintertime gives you the best chance of seeing them. But is there anything else worth doing in Iceland? If chasing the Aurora Borealis is a bust and you don't see them? My family was in the exact situation this past January. We were planning a trip to England as my daughter was spending a semester abroad at the University of Southampton. We had always wanted to visit Iceland and had fantasized about being able to see the magic of the Northern Lights. So we scheduled a five-day stopover in Iceland. But what if we didn't see them? Would the trip be a complete bust? Was there anything else worthwhile to do? In this video, we'll highlight our journey with some of the things that we didn't know along with tips and tricks for first-time visitors to Iceland. Then, we'll highlight all the things we were able to do and let you know whether or not it was worth it. We'll start off with some tips and tricks that we learned as first-timers to Iceland. We did a lot of research on flights into Iceland, comparing Iceland Air to budget airlines like Play. While Iceland Air had free stopovers in Iceland when traveling from the US to Europe, Booking Play Airlines to Iceland, and then Iceland Air to London, was actually cheaper. One thing we didn't realize was that Play did not have TSA Pre, so leaving the US was a bit more time-consuming, as we had to go through the regular line, take our shoes off, and remove liquids for scanning. Apparently, TSA Pre agreements are with individual airlines, not the airport. So, if that is important to you, a budget airline might not be the best bet. The only other con we had with Play Airlines was that there was no in-flight entertainment or Wi-Fi. So load up on offline things you can do before you board. The last thing we want to mention that was a huge bonus for Play Airlines is since it's a new airline, there are less travelers. The plane was not full, and we actually found entire rows empty that you can move to and sleep during the flight. This was a huge plus since our trip was a six-hour red-eye from Washington, D.C. to Reykjavik that landed at five in the morning. That leads to our next tip. If you arrive super early in the morning, like 5 a.m., spend some time in the airport. Shop in the duty-free shop. Have breakfast at one of the restaurants. There's nothing else to do. Our family is so used to landing in the airport and getting on the move, we instinctively got our rental car and started traveling. We had already booked our reservations at the Blue Lagoon to enter at 8 a.m. But the Blue Lagoon was only half an hour away from the airport. Instead, we ended up sitting in an Orcan gas station mini-mart until the Blue Lagoon opened. One last tip before you leave the airport. We would recommend grabbing some cash there from an ATM before you head out. While the fees might be a little higher, we actually had a hard time finding an ATM along our journey. We did not actively look to find one, but expected them to be everywhere. They were not, and the one we did see was actually out of order. So if you need some Iceland Krona, grab it from the airport. You will not need a ton, as almost everything is electronic payment. But if you want some for tour guide tips or small purchases, it doesn't hurt to get some cash at the airport. Overall, very little is needed as tips are not expected in Iceland. To be honest, we did not take out any cash during our trip and tipped with American dollars. Our next tip is a travel tip. If you are renting a car in the winter, get a four-wheel drive or at minimum an all-wheel drive. We rented from Hertz because they had cars right at the airport in the parking lot. To our surprise, when we went outside, not only was it sleeting freezing rain, but there were wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour, and the parking lot was not plowed. With those possible conditions, you will want a vehicle that is able to drive effectively in the winter. By the same token, you will want many layers and waterproof gear to stay warm and dry. It is the winter, so it is cold. And some of the most amazing things to see in Iceland are the ice caves and waterfalls. These destinations can be cold and wet, so be prepared. Also, 
bring a pair of crampons so you can walk on some pretty slick terrain. There is a lot of ice in Iceland, of course, so you'll want proper footwear. That being said, if you're low on packing space, you can buy all of these things once you land in Iceland. Finally, if you're going to take a ton of photos and videos, which we would expect with such amazing places in Iceland, if you are going there in the winter, we would recommend getting a retractable selfie stick with a button so you can start and stop video or take pictures with gloves on. As you can imagine, it is cold in Iceland during the winter, and you'll be happy not having to take your gloves on and off to get footage. So that's it with our tips and tricks. Before we move on to highlight our trip, we want to share some things we learned in Iceland. First, drink the tap water. Icelanders are proud that they have some of the purest water in the world. Since the water flows from crystal clear glaciers through miles of sediment that act as charcoal filters, by the time it gets to you to drink, it's some of the cleanest drinking water in the world, being free of chlorine or calcium or nitrate. Second, while we knew there were geothermal power plants in Iceland, we thought that is where they converted geothermal energy into electricity to run to all the households. While that is true, the thing that we were amazed about is they actually also pump scalding hot water to heat 90% of the homes. Third, having visited the lava center, we learned that volcanoes are still super active in Iceland, with two eruptions happening just in 2022. These eruptions were close to the airport and the Blue Lagoon, which worries folks that they may have to be relocated if activity increases. Finally, one little known fact is that the Blue Lagoon one of Iceland's most visited attractions was actually created by mistake. The Blue Lagoon was actually created from wastewater. When building a geothermal power plant, hot water was used to power turbines for electricity. They didn't know what to do with the water flow, so thinking that lava rock would drain, they decided to pump water out into the lava field and let it trickle down into the ground. That ended up being a big wonderful mistake because instead of filtering into the ground, the water filled up with silica mud and actually sealed all of the holes in the lava rock, forming these hot lagoons that we now relax in. Serendipitously, that leads us to the first amazing thing to see in the wintertime in Iceland, the Blue Lagoon. As mentioned, we got to the Blue Lagoon as soon as it opened, 8 in the morning. As this was a splurge trip for us, we got the Retreat Spa package. While expensive, we believe it was worth it for the private showers, pools, and spa treatments. You enter through the retreat hotel. There, we were able to have a complimentary breakfast and then head into the retreat spa. We have little footage here as video and photos were not really allowed in the spa, but needless to say, the experience was a luxury. You had a private changing room and shower, access to private pools, a special spa treatment, and admittance to the larger Blue Lagoon area. In addition, we were able to eat in the more exclusive spa restaurant, which was more relaxing with less people. After the Blue Lagoon, we headed to our remote hotel, Hotel Ranga in Hela, southern Iceland. We chose Hotel Ranga because it was more luxurious, yet remote. An experience catering to visitors that wanted to see the Northern Lights. They had Northern Light wake-up calls if you wanted to be alerted to head outside if the Aurora Borealis was active. We stayed in the Royal Suite since there were three of us, which was a luxury in itself. It was a large room with a sitting area with a sofa bed, a large hot tub, a king size bed, and a large double sink, double shower bathroom. We also got a complimentary bottle of wine by booking online with them directly. As it was remote, we ate most of our meals there but that was not disappointing as they had a full complimentary breakfast and some unbelievable fine dining choices for lunch and dinner. The staff was amazing and they even stopped us to let us know if there was anything else we wanted to just give them a day or two notice and they would arrange it for us. That night after being a little jet lagged and a full day at the Blue Lagoon, we crashed. At the remote location of Hotel Ranga, it was pitch black. I woke up and I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. 
Even though there was free breakfast until 10 a.m., in the darkness, it was easy to sleep right through it, and we missed it that first day. I couldn't believe it. I slept for 15 hours. So, if you visit Iceland in the winter and you want to make the most of your day, set an alarm. It was during our first dinner that we asked our waitress what she would recommend doing the next day. She said to go to the tomato farm. That seemed like a strange recommendation, but we looked it up and it was a unique and worthwhile destination. So the next day, we headed out. Wow, we were amazed and it was one of the best things we did. It was amazing to learn how Iceland had these huge greenhouses to grow crops year round during inclement weather how they imported bees for fertilization, and how we could have a hearty, fresh lunch there with everything tomato, including tomato soup, tomato beer, even tomato cheesecake. For first time visitors looking at the tomato soup and bread table, you feel like you have to order that, which we did and recommend. But just so you know, regardless of what you order, everyone gets free bread from the table. After the tomato farm, our next stop was Strucker Geyser, this stop was amazing. The geyser erupts every two to seven minutes, so you don't have to wait too long to see an eruption. Again, since it's winter and might be cold and wet, make sure you bring warm layers of clothing, waterproof gear, and crampons for walking on some pretty slick terrain. That being said, apparently if you're a local, you can just wear flip-flops. Our last stop of the day was Gullfoss Waterfall. It was a spectacular view of one of Iceland's many waterfalls. Hiking up from the parking lot of the falls, you could get some aerial views. And there was a path to the Gullfoss shop and cafeteria that we went to to do a little shopping and to grab a bite to eat. The cafeteria was okay and we filled up, but personally, I would not recommend the pizza. It was pretty much a frozen pizza heated up in the oven. On our drive back, we saw some interesting views and cool sunsets, along with some things we wanted to say were the Northern Lights. But honestly, it was just light pollution from nearby towns in an overcast sky. The next day was pretty bad weather, so we chose to do an indoor activity. The lava center was just down the road, so we ran out there and did our tour. It was here that we learned that Iceland was still full of earthquakes and volcanic activity with eruptions as recent as last year. Apparently, Iceland is in the perfect position for this, being on top of a mantelplume, which is basically a magma pipe for volcanic activity. As such, there are many volcanic eruptions even today, leading to lava flow out to the sea. In fact, Iceland is getting larger and larger due to this creation of lava plains as the molten rock runs to the Atlantic. On our fourth full day, we decided to take the journey out to Jokulsarlen Glacial Lagoon in Diamond Beach. It was a long trip, so we had to leave at 8 a.m. to get there in the daylight. We took a cool Rubicon Jeep with 40-inch tires to handle any obstacle or weather we might run into. The ride out there along the coastline and glacial plains was scenic. We stopped at a few sites along the way, including the Fjardagargluven Canyon and the Skaterö Bridge Monument. My apologies if I'm butchering the Icelandic language. As mentioned, it's a long drive and it took about four and a half hours to get out to Jokosarlen Glacial Lake. The glacier was beautiful and amazing to see, but I think it would have been a better visit in another season when you could have actually taken a boat trip out onto the lagoon to get close up to the glaciers. The highlight of the trip was Diamond Beach, where it was amazing to see chunks of ice washed up along the black lava beach, the epitome of Iceland as the land of ice and fire. On the way back, we stopped at Fjarsalon Glacier Lake, which is sometimes called Jokosarlan's little brother. We actually thought that it was more breathtaking as you could really see the huge blue glacial mouth from the trail ridge.
While this day tour had some really beautiful sights, I don't know if I would completely recommend it, as it was a really long drive and took most of the day. So, a matter of personal preference. Our fifth and final day there ended up being the highlight of the entire trip. A trip to see the ice caves of Katla from Vic. We almost did not go because the weather was going to be freezing rain, but we bought some waterproof gear at the icewear shop and headed out. This trip by far was our favorite. You traveled in a monster van across the Merderskukul Glacier and then hiked to the ice caves. It was a mini magical adventure using ropes and planks to traverse rivers created by the melting ice. The ice glimmers in ways that look like scales of translucent blue ice in the amazing tunnels. You feel as if you're in some other fantastical world. You can see why places like this were used for cinematic backdrops for series like Game of Thrones. Welcome to the lands beyond the wall. Since we were already geared up for cold weather and the rain, we hit two more waterfalls on our last day. Both were right off Route 1, so worth a visit. Selyalandsfoss and Skoavoss. The ice cave tour was a great way to end our five days in Iceland. We were disappointed that the entire stay was too overcast to get a glimpse of the northern lights. But visiting there in the winter was well worth it, as there were plenty of other great activities to do, and I'm sure it was less crowded. Must-dos are the ice caves and the Blue Lagoon. Would we come back in the winter? Probably not. We decided we had to come back during the summertime in order to take advantage of the beautiful scenery and do more hiking. But if we were going to chase the northern lights again in the winter, we would probably go try to see them in a new destination like Norway, Sweden, or Finland. Thanks for watching this video. Hope it helps. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and share it with others.